Well, we begin the fourth session. Uh, in the first three sessions, we focus on trade issues. Well, now we move to investments. Trade and investment are closely related, especially in the recent years. New trade and investment rules are emerging on the bilateral and regional levels. While emerging rules are fragmented and lack of e effective coordination, in this se session, we'll fo discuss the following issues. The first one is how to forest for the global investment cooperation. The second, how to ensure that international trade and investment regimes are coherent and support economic development. The third one is, what can D20 do to help encourage trade and investment cooperation? Well, we know that in the G20, 2016 working trade and investment working group meetings, they have five key issues, and investment is one of these file issues. We hope we can have ideas to support G20 meetings. And now, since we have a relatively tight schedule in the file 30, we need to welcome speech of the DG. So uh, each panelist will have 10 minutes to have their presentations. Uh, first, we will move the floor to James Jan, Senior Director, Investment and, and Enterprise, ACTAD. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, I wish to express uh, my gratitude to um, the, the T20 Presidency, um, DG um, Zhang and the other team to invite me and uh, to give me this opportunity. I'm in a kind of, uh, kind of a murky situation um, or position. UNCTAD is positioned as a think tank for developing countries, but it's also an intergovernmental body. Um, it provides technical support to various kind of inter intergovernmental bodies, including G20 and, and others. So um, in that sense, perhaps I'm a little bit privileged to know a bit about the G20 process, particularly the trade investment work stream and also development working stream um, and a part of the task forces like uh, digital economy, um, like new industrial revolution, and, and also um, uh, innovation um, task forces. But here, I understand that my assignment is to talk about how to foster future global investment cooperation in the context of G20, and how to address the issue of interrelationship between trade and investment in the context of G20. So there are two. Um, interrelated but different issues. Regarding the first issue, um, how to foster um, collaboration in the area of investment, I think there are five areas or four areas that, uh, that the G20 can, can work on. And in fact, it started with one and still um, leaving the other three uh, aside for the time being. One is um, to formulate guiding principles for investment policy making at the national and international levels. This is important in the absence of a multilateral investment system, um, unlike WTO for trade and IMF for, you know, for finance. And we know that the international investment regime is highly fragmented, multilayered, and multifaceted. And also at the national level, um, the investment policy making is at a crossroad. Um, we see that um, um, industrial policy and industrial uh, development strategies is back in fashion in many, many countries, developed and developing countries alike. And we see that countries are intensifying their uh, efforts to promote and facilitate the investment on the one hand and putting in protectionism uh, protectionist measures on the other. So the, the, the dichotomy is happening at the national level. In light of that, there could be a kind of consensus building um, at global level um, with G20 taking the leadership in this area. Um, I think G20 is working on that, uh, working very hard on that, and there's a hope for having something out at a very high level of 
which is called guiding principles. Now, there are three other areas where G20 can work on and haven't been able to. One is um, to foster a kind of a shared view on key issues for improving the international investment regime. Um, to, com uh, to remedy commonly perceived problems and concerns regarding the current multi-layered, multifaceted, highly um, fragmented international investment regimes, as you know, that consist of 3,300 investment treaties at a bilateral, regional, sub-regional, sub and inter-regional level. And there are a lot of um, um, pressure for reform of a such a regime. In fact, in fact, the consensus has emerged to improve and to reform this regime. The issue is that how and to what extent. In that sense, G20 can take the leadership. And the starting point, of course, is to build a kind of common understanding um, on the key criteria for reform to understand um, different approaches for improving the regime. Now, the third um, area could be a kind of a global investment facilitation package. Why investment facilitation? Let's look at what we have so far in terms of policies at the national level and international level. At the national level, UNCTAD has done a survey of invest foreign investment laws and regulations in 111 countries. What we have found out that there is a lack of investment facilitation dimension in these laws and regulations. We also have a database that is monitoring the investment policy trends, the new investment policy measures putting in place over the last three decades. Over the last five years, for example, we looked at our database, um, about 117 investment policy measures were put in place by over 100 countries. And uh, <coughs> over half of the <coughs> policy measures, when it, when it deals with investment promotion facilitation, over half of the measures were basically relate to investment incentives. And another 25 percent related to uh, economic zones. So there are only 22 percent of the policy measures put in place over the past years were related to investment promotion and facilitation. And the promotion part is, is larger than the facilitation. Looking at the international level, we see this 3,300 investment treaties. Um, we surveyed them because we have the treaty database. Um, over 90 percent of the investment treaties do not have investment facilitation components. Even though a large number of the treaties called investment protection and investment facilitation promotion. So the overwhelming majority of the treaties do not have investment facilitation as a component. That leaves a systemic gap. And, and the investment facilitation is critical, particularly at, the, at this time. As we know, at the global level, um, the, FDI recover, the role of, AD, of FDI recovery is bumpy. And over the past five years, that we see the seesaw type of um, um, the phenomena in investment. Of course, last year, 2015, global FDI increased significantly, uh, increased by 36 percent. But if you really look into the composition of the FDI, you see that it, it was basically boosted by cross-border merger acquisitions, in particular, in particular, due to the corporate reconfigurations, including um, including um, tax avoidance related measures, we call the corporate re inversion. Um, if we take that out, 
um, the, the, the inversion part, and global FDI increased by 15 percent instead of 36 percent. And compare with, and compare with the pre-crisis peak level, is still much lower. So that's there's a need for global investment promotion facilitation, and we know that it's this bumpy road to recovery of FDI affected the expansion of global value chain, therefore affect the growth of global trade. Now, the second important issue related to investment facilitation is that we know that there's a global efforts of, of achieving SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. But no investment, no goals achievement. So investment is critical, and we assessed that there's 2.5 trillion U.S. dollars annual gap for developing countries in achieving SDGs, in investment, in infrastructure, education, health, urban development, rural development, food security, so on and so forth. So there is a gap. There is a need for investment promotion facilitation. Therefore, I think G20 can take the leadership in that area. And UNCTAD has already formulated an action manual um, of 10 action lines with over 40 actions that for countries, for group of countries, for um, the groups like G20 to adapt and adopt, to pick and choose in, um, in promoting and facilitating investment. The fourth issue area relates to the investment for, uh, promotion to low-income countries, that linked also to SDGs. I think G20 should not just work on its own, promote trade investment of its, uh, of its own country, uh, of, of its own memberships, but also promoting investment to low-income countries. There is a need for such a leadership at a global level. So these, these are the, the work that that we believe the G20 can play a role in terms of leadership and in terms of coordination. Now, the fifth one is related to our second topic, that is um, trade investment relationship. Um, what, what can be done? Um, and in fact, um, um, I wish to share with you the, the key findings of a report jointly prepared by WTO UNCTAD OECD and World Bank at request of G20. Um, and, and we submitted this report, and Hamid is there, and his team was also working on that. Um, and, that's, and we emphasized the importance of the interrelationship between trade and investment. Um, and that is so obvious. I think here you are all, um, all research researchers and the policy analysis um, um, uh, people so that you know how important it is I don't have to to cite figures and um, to to support or to substantiate what I mean but in the report um, basically um, the agencies analyzed um, the the importance of the global value chain um, the growing importance of services and also draw attention to the G20, there's important phenomena that is neither trade nor investment, but related to trade and investment. It is non-equity mold of um, international transactions. It's in the magnitude of annual 2.4 to 2.6 trillion US dollars type of transaction. What we mean that is, um, is contract farming, contract manufacturing, um, licensing, um, franchising, um, and there's a number of activities that are part and parcel of global value chain, but it's, it's not directly under any policies or regulations of trade and investment. It's something we call in the middle. Um, and that requires an integrated treatment of trade, investment, and the non-equity forms of international production. And we see the new forms of, 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 of that coming up due to the digital economy. So um, 
based on that, um, I think I don't have much time. I just say that the paper, the paper concludes that the trade investments are increasingly complementary, interdependent, and intertwined in today's global economy. So therefore, there's a need for policy coherence and the synergies uh, in, in this area, not only in terms of policy formulation, but also institutional setup. If we know that the trade investment promotion agencies, they need to work together. And for many countries, they are not because they are separate, and even under different ministries. And we need to see um, how um, at, a, at, at, a, at a government level that the trade and investment ministries should work together. In, even in G20 countries, trade issue, some, for some countries, that trade issue is dealt with by the Ministry of Commerce, and the investment issue is dealt with uh, uh, by the Ministry of, of Finance. So sometimes there's a lack of coordination and coherence in, in their approaches. And we see that through the international investment treaties on the one hand, particularly those bilateral investment treaties only focusing on investment and those tr trade treaties. Uh, and we see a lot of inconsistencies um, in those treaties and between the two types of treaties. So um, we propose that the G20 should study a number of issues. One is the how to strengthen its synergies and avoid incoherence between trade and investment, uh, investment policies at the national and international levels in the future, and the where do the main policy barriers, inconsistent and gaps lies, and how to deal with them. And also to deal with the issues of, like the, uh, to study the impact of the new generation of RTAs, and to draw lessons learned from those um, uh, experiences in both trade investment rulemaking, and to ensure that they complement and build up on the multilateral trading system. And so also um, to study uh, the integrated policies related to multinational companies into the overall trade investment policy framework and to fill some policy gaps in the non-equity modes of, of, of international production. So th there are also a number of other um, issues that we raised and hopefully G20 will work in this area and uh, addressing those issues. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the answer. Uh, uh, he just emphasized that G20 has an important weight in global investment affairs, and G20 should take leadership and make coordinations in the areas of investment facilitation and promotion, and also improve trade and investment coherence. And then, uh, now we just uh, uh, turn the floor to the next speaker, Alex Berger. He is the T he is in the T20 Institute German Development. Institute. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much to the organizers for, for the invitation. I think it's been a, a, a great day and a, a, we had uh, already very good um, discussions. I would like to focus on the reform needs and also the reform options with regard to the international investment regime or the complex uh, system of international investment agreements uh, and what role the G20 can play in, uh, in this uh, reform process. So I would like to pick up a couple of points with uh, which uh, uh, James uh, Zahn already raised and, uh, and discuss them. Um, I should also mention that my presentation is based on a joint and forthcoming paper, um, uh, which I, um, I'm writing with a colleague from the Kiel Institute of World um, Economy, uh, once in Liu, and this is what I would like to talk about. Uh, so I would like to, to give a very brief uh, overview of the, uh, the current system and the legitimacy crisis of the system. Uh, then I would like to focus on three very interesting and very uh, important uh, negotiations processes uh, which are going on in, in a triangle. I would like to focus then also 
on develop developments beyond this triangle, which is obviously uh, negotiations between the EU, the US and China. And then I would like to focus on which kind of reform options are there and what the role of the G20 can be in order to uh, foster those reforms. So let's focus very briefly on the, on the current system. Uh, James Tsan already mentioned that it's a very fragmented system. So it's based on uh, 3, 000, more than 3,000 treaties, different kinds of treaties uh, negotiated on different levels, uh, dealing with different issues, of, uh, sometimes uh, also sectoral issues. Um, there's no comprehensive or WTO-like um, organization with regard to investment. Um, the, the system is criticized, or the treaties are criticized, uh, for their one-sided focus on investment protection. Um, um, and uh, the system is also criticized for incoherent rulings of arbitration tribunals. Um, it's criticized for um, a, a private and ad hoc arbitration mechanisms, which are often intransparent. Uh, there's an inherent conflict of interests of arbitrators and counselors. Um, there's no appeals mechanism, and so on, and so on, and so on. And last, last but not least, um, there is no, um, no solid evidence that international investment agreements actually lead to more foreign direct investments. So um, that's why a lot of people argue that the system is actually in a uh, legitim legitimacy crisis, there's a big reform need. How do countries re uh, respond to this legitimacy crisis? So some countries, actually very few countries, retreat from the system. They uh, retreat from the um, uh, ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Uh, some countries uh, like South Africa or Indonesia or a couple of Latin American countries terminate bilateral investment treaties. But, um, but the, the, uh, the main response to the crisis is that countries uh, stop signing investment treaties or they just sign a fewer treaties. But actually a couple of, of uh, countries continue um, um, to negotiate investment rules, but they do this in other types of treaties, in particular in free trade agreements um, that also include comprehensive investment chapters. So there is a, um, um, a wide range of, of reactions by countries to the legitimacy crisis. Let's focus on the triangle, what we call the triangle of global investment governance. Um, so, obviously, in the absence of a multilateral investment framework, investment agreement, or however you would like to call this, um, the negotiations between the EU, the US, and the framework of uh, TTIP, uh, between the US, EU, and China, in, in the context of two bilateral investment treaties, uh, this is the place where, where we believe the, the future rules for the, uh, uh, for the international investment regime will be written or, to some extent, um, um, defined. And um, if, we, if we see convergence in this, uh, in this triangle, then this will have a huge impact on future rulemaking in international investment regime. And we actually see some convergence uh, between the approaches or policies by, by the US, EU, and China. So um, obviously, the US, in the context of, of NAFTA, but um, uh, has a huge influence on the system. So after the EU decided to negotiate investment rules in the context of an EU-wide policy and not, not on the basis of bilateral treaties, we see actually a NAFTAization. So, uh, of, uh, of the EU's post-Lisbon um, uh, international investment policy. So just have a look at the, uh, at the investment chapter of CETA, the Canada-EU um, um, free trade agreement, which, is, which looks uh, very much like um, the NAFTA approach, if you, if you focus on the substantive, uh, substantive provisions, for example. We also see a um, partial NAFTAization of China's policy. 
in particular with regard to substantive uh, uh, provisions where China adopted some of the legal innovations developed in the context of, of the US, new U.S. model uh, BIT uh, with regard to a reformulation of, uh, of certain key provisions like uh, fair and equitable treatment and indirect expropriation. Uh, it's partial because uh, China was traditionally very hesitant to uh, adopt the market access uh, or market liberalization approach, which the U.S. Uh, pioneered. But uh, since um, 2013, um, uh, China is also, at least in principle, um, uh, um, open to negotiate on this kind of comprehensive U.S. approach. So there is a, a, a general agreement within the triangle with regard to that with regard to the pre-establishment phase that investment treaties should also address the market access uh, uh, component. Um, there's an agreement that uh, there's a need to refine substantive provisions. There's also an agreement that more transparency is needed in investment arbitration proceedings. Of course, there's, there's still some conflicting ideas, for example, or conflicting interests, for example, how deep market access uh, commitments should be. Um, and then um, that's the, the, the discussion between U.S. and China mainly. And then there's another discussion, very interesting discussion, um, mainly between EU and U.S. on how uh, a dispute settlement uh, system should be designed. There's a new interesting proposal by the EU uh, with regard to the establishment of an investor court system. So there's some... Uh, uh, some convergence in this triangle, but uh, if you look, we would like to look beyond the triangle, uh, focusing uh, focusing on the other G20 countries. Um, we ac uh, can actually observe very diverging trends, right? Um, so there are some some extreme examples like South Africa or Indonesia, which uh, already terminated or expressed their intention to terminate um, bilateral investment treaties. There is the example of India, which uh, just uh, recently um, submitted a uh, substantially rewritten uh, treaty template, which gives the state much more room uh, in, all, in, in regulating foreign direct investments. Then there is the Brazil example. Uh, Brazil traditionally um, negotiated no, uh, or uh, yeah, signed no investment treaty and now adopts a, an alternative model, which is focusing on facilitation. So as a result, I would argue, or we would argue, there is no G20-wide base or even political will for a multilateral or even a plurilateral investment agreement. And so there is no mem momentum for such negotiations. Um, but anyway, the reform need is there, and what should the G G20 do? Um, I would argue, or we would argue, that uh, the reform of substantive provisions, so the provisions which actually uh, um, tell us how uh, in, uh, foreign investors should be protected, is very difficult and it's uh, it's not achievable in the short term uh, because there's, it's a system of three thousand treaties. Yeah, just imagine how would you uh, on earth uh, renegotiate three thousand treaties? It's very time time consuming. It's uh, it's um, beyond the capacity of many, many countries. So it's not realistic in the short term that this huge, complex body of treaties will be renegotiated. Rene there are some, some interesting uh, suggestions out there how to deal with the uh, problem that most of the substantive provisions um, um, actually grant too much protection for foreign investors, as, as many people would, would say. Uh, for example, there's an, uh, a suggestion to, to have a multilateral convention where, where uh, countries come together and agree on, 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 on an interpretation of some of the very vague concepts you, you find in investment treaties, like the Fair and Equal Treatment Clause. So this might be an approach. <clears throat> there's already an example for, for such a multilateral convention. It's a Mauritius Convention where uh, many, many countries came together and, and, um, and um, introduced rules for the transparency of, of our international arbitration uh, system. So there, there's quite some, that, this could be an idea which could be picked up by the G20 in order to reform this, some of the substantive provisions. 
Um, but still, it will be uh, will be a difficult process, and that's why we would argue that the uh, reform of the procedural provisions, so the dispute settlement part of these treaties, is more promising, um, at least in the short and medium term. Um, I already mentioned the the example of the Mauritius, Mauritius Convention with, uh, with regard to to increasing the transparency of uh, investor state dispute settlement proceedings, um, and there are also some quite new, fresh ideas with regard to the establishment of, of an appeals mechanism, which is lacking currently in the system, um, and maybe even a global investment court. Um, this may sound like very bold and very, uh, yeah, very bold ideas, but we've got, we've, we see some first steps in this direction. Uh, if you look at the uh, Canada-EU uh, free trade agreement, and uh, its investment chapter. If you focus on the EVFTA, the FTA signed between uh, European Union and Vietnam, there the European Union is trying to um, persuade countries to sign up to the idea of having an appeals mechanism, first of all bilateral, and having a, a court system, of course, first of all bilaterally. But then there's a there's an idea that uh, this could be could be multilateralized if enough countries sign up to these uh, kind of um, uh, new rules. But of course, all of this depends on what the U.S. will do in the context of of the TTIP negotiations, if they agree to the EU's proposal or not. Um, but again, there's some momentum where the G20 can uh, support such uh, processes. So uh, we argue that the G20 has a major role to play in the reform of the international investment regime because there's no WTO-like institution in the regime. So we would argue that the uh, G20 has uh, three roles to play. First of all, facilitate dialogue. James Chan uh, already mentioned this. Um, building a consensus on um, the objectives of, of investment treaties key principles and, of course, also uh, the concrete contents of reformed international investment agreements. Uh, of course, in, uh, in, in these discussions, it should be taken into account that there is a need for coherence with other, uh, uh, with other regimes and other objectives uh, formulated in other regimes, for example, and in particular the, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the, the, the whole climate agenda. It's also important to engage non-G20 members in these reform um, uh, in these reform processes, and we acknowledge that it's a politically very difficult uh, a topic to discuss at the moment in the G20, and that's why uh, we also propose that two-track fora, such as a T20. Um, might be used to overcome some blockages or to 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 um, 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 yeah to foster co uh, cooperation on these issues. Then uh, obviously the G20 has a has an important role to play in monitoring recent developments in the international investment regime. I think it's even more important to do that in the international investment regime than in the trade regime because you have more treaties and you have a much more fragmented. Um, uh, system, and you don't have a WTO, which can support in monitoring. So the G20 has a, a huge role to play. And third, there's also um, a, um, um, a role to play for, for the WTO in terms of negotiating or f facilitating negotiations. Um, I think that's more a, a longer-term objective, but still, it, uh, there's a role the G20 can play in this respect. Thank you very much. Thanks for Alex. Uh, in his speech, he focused on the following key issues. Uh, the, the first key word is legitimacy crisis. The second one is triangle. The third one is reform of investment, uh, re reform of provisions. And uh, the, the fourth one is the role of G20. Uh, thank you. And we move to the third speaker. He is Rooster Powell, pro professor and co-director of Center for Trade and Economic Integration. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dong, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm reminded of Simon Evanett's um, 
complaint that we are all adding to the wish list of, of things that the G20 should do. I will deviate from this and give you my view on something it should not do. So my view, and it's slightly different, although not as much as it may seem, from what Alex just said is that at the moment, this is, at least when it comes to investment lawmaking at the global level, this is a time for innovation. It's a time to experiment, uh, not a time to multilateralize. Uh, and at best, the way I see it, like the OECD, the WTO, the G20, could also start a dialogue, but on very specific issues. And I'll, I'll come to that. Now, I've studied the, this investment regime through the lens of a complex adaptive system. And it's really, as the previous speakers have, have highlighted, it really is amazing how it resembles um, biological evolution or how it resembles the way anthills operate or the global economy or the internet, namely a very decentralized composition. Yet we do see self-organized um, organic emergence of some coherence that was already discussed earlier. And like these other regimes that are not social but more economic or um, uh, physics related biological regimes, the investment regime is highly contested but at the same time very stable. As Alex uh, showed a moment ago, countries continue to conclude these treaties even though there is really a crisis going on. So just to rephrase some of the evidence that was already presented on how there is recent self-organized coherence emerging in that regime. Even though we don't have a centralized WTO multilateral treaty out there, it's kind of happening organically. At the treaty level, it is amazing to see the number of plurilaterals that have been concluded in this field, not only in ASEAN, the fact that the EU since 2009, does it at the level of the 28 member states. ICSID has never had as many member states uh, before, although some of them are leaving. The Mauritius Convention on Transparency and in Investor State Arbitration is quite an achievement. And if you think of it, CETA, Canada, the EU, is a big treaty. TPP is about half of G20 in some respects. And soon we may have agreements on investment in RCEP and who knows uh, TTIP. So there is momentum, there is increased coherence at the treaty level. And I would say, as Alex and James have said, also at the substantive level. And I'm a lawyer, I hesitate to make such generalizations, but I think there's a surprising amount of convergence, even though the technical detail may be somewhat different on essentially three points. One is protection uh, levels, rules on expropriation, fair and equitable treatment, non-discrimination. High degree of convergence, and I'm talking US, Europe, India, Brazil, on a reaffirmation of the right to regulate and to confirm exceptions to investment protection. And then thirdly, really almost no stabilization clauses anymore in these investment treaties, which basically commit countries not to change their regulatory regime, or umbrella clauses, which commit countries to enforce contracts uh, through investor state arbitration. So high level of coherence is happening. Also at the level of arbitration, and this picture may really literally look like an anthill, but it is actually the interaction between arbitrators in investor state arbitration and connecting dots when they are appointed on the same tribunal. What it shows is that there's a self-organized coherence in the sense that it's a group of 20 arbitrators who decide most of the cases. Um, again, it's happening naturally and it offers a, a, a sense of, of coherence. Now, uh, one of the projects we've been doing at the Graduate Institute is to check whether we could move from TPP to a plurilateral, multilateral investment treaty. And what is striking, if you use um, text analysis software, that is really just looking at convergence in the text of TPP and other FTAs or investment chapters out there, the investment chapter in TPP is 82% similar 
to the investment chapter in the US Columbia FDA, which is amazing, right? So there's a, a high degree of similarity, not a lot of innovation actually in TPP uh, is happening. Now, through another project done by students, we coded the types of provisions that TPP includes on investment. And then we double checked whether other countries, especially in the G20, have in the last five or six years concluded investment treaties with the same features in there. So we've coded about 109 features in TPP. And if you look at um, the investment treaties that China, South Korea, the EU has concluded recently, there's a high degree of convergence uh, at that level as well. So I think someone mentioned it earlier, you, you referred to a triangle. I, I do see as well uh, a surprising level of con convergence um, between the US, the EU, China, South Korea, uh, Canada already at this stage. Now, another element that really drives this coherence, and I've, I've copied this from, from one of your reports, James, is to remember that it's difficult to talk of export, capital exporting or capital importing countries uh, at this stage. This is the G20 countries and the number of times they have been involved in investor state arbitration. So the first column is G20 members as respondent states. So no surprise there that you have developing countries like Argentina, uh, Mexico, um, being sued often because they are traditionally the capital importing countries. What is striking is that also Canada, 24, the US, 15, has an increasing number of cases against it. So countries are no longer thinking as capital exporting, capital importing, but really as regulating governments. And the column next to it also shows that with respect to who is actually initiating, who is the investor initiating cases, the same um, trend is, is there. So no doubt US companies, uh, German companies, French companies, Canadian companies file a lot of cases. But look at China. They have actually filed more cases as investors as they, has been, as they have been sued, four against two. I'm originally from Belgium. They sued, a Chinese investor sued uh, Belgium on some financial crisis measure. Uh, they lost, by the way, which I'm, um, yeah. A big, big case for Belgium um, was, was a couple of years in the making. So China has been investing a lot, suing. Uh, its investors have been suing. And look at Turkey as well. 19 cases filed as opposed to 11 um, cases uh, faced by Turkey. Now, time to experiment, really, because as Alex was saying, there is an amazing amount of reform happening at the moment. And I think it would be a mistake to multilateralize at this stage. It's too early. We have to let it go. We have to really experiment, try things out, and see how it evolves. The same complex adaptive system theories that I've mentioned earlier, and this really comes from physics and it's an analogy, tell you that really you have to be at the edge of chaos for a system to be adaptive, to be fluid enough. So there's no point being in a form of ice, which arguably the WTO is at this stage, nor is it making a lot of sense to be in the too chaotic form of gas. The sweet spot to be in really is water. And I think for trade, but also for investment, we need to find that sweet spot between the fusion of the same provisions leading to convergence and continuing to innovate, to reform, to adapt to challenges which then also leads to divergence. So we need to give space to the EU proposal on an investment court system, see how it works. I think it would be a mistake to multilateralize too quickly. Brazil has a, an interesting new model. India is experimenting. The second final uh, model BIT is very different from the first. South Africa is trying to do it through domestic law. Let's innovate and experiment and let's avoid icing it through early, through militarization at, at this stage. What is really interesting, and this is borne out by the data, this is another research project we are working on, is that innovation actually happens far more often between heterogeneous parties. We see an amazing amount of innovation in NAFTA, almost no innovation in TPP. 
If anything, I would expect a lot of innovation in TTIP if ever it gets concluded. So, if at all, the G20, the Group on Trade and Investment, I think what they could do is start a dialogue and to discuss the core issues of divergence. And I see four of them. And really, if we want to really get down to these things, that's what we should be talking about. One is what Alex mentioned already. There's major upheaval happening with the EU proposal to set up an investment court system. So either you follow the traditional model of unilateral party-appointed arbitrators, or you move closer to something like the WTO appellate body with a standing tribunal, an appellate mechanism, um, stricter rules on ethics, very interesting EU proposals on costs on involving SMEs more. Those are things we need to test. We know in the WTO some of the appellate body mechanisms at the moment are under fire. We cannot move too quickly to something similar in the investment uh, sphere. Second point, and that is substantive, I see most divergence, most debates happening, not so much on investment protection standards. All countries agree that if you expropriate, you have to pay for it, that you shouldn't treat investors unfairly. The sticking point is how much should we commit to open markets, to investment to come in in the first place? Um, RCEP, I've been told, is stuck because they can't agree on the positive or the negative list approach to exactly that issue. Performance requirements are a big issue in the US, the EU models, especially in the US models. China doesn't seem to be willing to go into that direction. We need to sit down and talk about which performance requirements should be prohibited. Should we really uh, tell countries you cannot um, impose any localization requirements or you cannot impose transfer of technology or local uh, use of local technologies? Those are the sticking points. Third point is, again, linked to the dispute settlement system, huge divergence on what do you make subject to state-to-state -state dispute settlement, the way you have it in the WTO, and what do you make subject, subject to private standing? I mean, that's a big deal to give companies the right to sue governments. The EU model is to only do it for investors once they have invested in the country, not to make uh, entry establishment of investment subject to ISDS. The US takes a much more liberal view, gives private standing far more easily. TPP, that is the US, is also quite keen on making investment contracts, authorizations, subject to ISDS. The EU and many other countries say only treaty breaches should, should be subject to ISDS. And a final point, but that's technical legal, but very important. The, the regime is complex, and we keep creating new treaties. We need to think carefully about how these new treaties interact with existing, or will interact with future IIE. Uh, A's. So the, the TPP, for example, there's 55 pre-existing investment agreements between the 12 TPP countries. Um, the CETA agreement as well, there's 15 pre-existing investment treaties between EU member states and Canada. So big divergence on whether we should include an MFN clause allowing investors to go back, for example, to NAFTA even though we have TPP now, or whether we should not apply MFN to better treatment than other treaties, which is what the CETA now uh, provides for. Of course, a, an easy way to deal with this is to do what the EU is advocating, is when you conclude a new treaty, you terminate the older one, uh, avoiding levels of, of complexity. So my conclusion is that as an observer, an academic observer, this is a fascinating moment in the regime of foreign investment. There's, on the one hand, lots of coherence, plurilaterals, but also lots of legal innovation. We should give it time, let's experiment, and avoid putting this thing on ice the way the WTO trade at a multilateral level is currently on ice. Let's experiment, and if anything, start a dialogue, but on very specific issues. Thank you. Uh, thanks for Juster. Innovation is one of his uh, the keywords in his presentation. It is also one of the keywords for the G20 
uh, China. Uh, I believe that for the innovation, there are at least two levels of innovation. One is that, like traditional in the microeconomic level, that is to technology upgrading and give impetus to the real economic growth. And the second level, just emphasize. Uh, like by Russell, this is the innovation of global governance, uh, one of the areas investment received. So, thank you. And now we welcome the fourth uh, speaker. This is Zhou Zhang. He is the law advisor of the in International Institute for Sustainable Development. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Don. Um, well, um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the organizers for inviting IRC to this um, very uh, um, prestigious event at this right timing. <clears throat> We at ISC, um, although we've been, I've to admit that although we've been um, following development um, at WTO recently, but um, for for the past several years, we've been um, more engaged in discussion um, over the other side of who the law If um, anyone understand what I mean here, um, so we're uh, for for those of you who are um, not very familiar um, with ISC, we're. Um, um, independent research institute that focus on policy reform and, um, that uh, leads to sustainable development. And one of the areas that we work on is the um, investment reform, um, the reform of the investment regime. So um, today, oops, there's a, I think it's a, okay, sorry about the, the, the character and uh, the mistakes on the on the PPT. I think there's some formatting issues there, but uh, I'll, I'll go through this my my presentation quickly because it's just uh, I understand at 5:30 um, the director general will be here sharp, so I have to finish it by then. Um, and uh, fortunately for me, I only have um, several key messages to deliver, so um, it should be easy for me to to go over it. Um, so first message. Um, the current investment regime is not contributing to the um, 2030 agenda. Uh, I, I think much has been discussed over this panel for the past speakers here. Um, uh, but just want to stress that the the General Assembly Resolution, the 17 um, goes that that adopted in the second half of last year. Uh, these are not just another layer of international commitments. These are passed uh, by the member states with the intention of being the defining agenda of the next 15 years. So all other international agenda must conform with the um, 2030 agenda. But this is not presently the case, especially in the area of investment. Um, the current investment regime is not is clearly not playing a role um, in contributing to achieving the SDGs. Now, the cost to this problem is multifaceted. Uh, the current, as many have discussed so far, the current investment regime is based on a very fragmented system. And the um, Excel mentioned the, uh, the 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 triangle of the uh, um, investment um, treaties um, at IIC. We're we're also talking about three things, but not the triangle of the treaties. We talk about the three sources of law um, that governing investment, the the international level obligations um, that includes over three thousand um, um, investment treaties as well as other international um, treaty obligations that impact on investment activities, including human rights law, including ILO conventions, um, environmental um, MEAs. Um, these are all obligations that states had committed to and would have an impact on um, the investment treaties. And at domestic level or international, more bilateral level, there are investment contracts signed by investors and states 
these also subject states and investors to various obligations. And also at domestic level, more national leader, national legislations and regulations on investment. And th this, all these sources of law, the current situation is that they're not conforming with each other. It's not a coherent system. And many of them are very, um, create very different or, or opposite obligations that against each other. Um, and to make things um, more complicated, the, the current um, investment regime is heavily relied on a dispute settlement system, as mentioned by many of my co-panelists, that, <coughs> that heavily um, relied on, um, built on the um, commercial arbitration system, which um, are basically a, a, a panel of three arbitrators will get to decide um, policy issues that have a huge impact on the uh, national policy and the welfare of community. Um, and these, and I have to mention here that um, th this adversarial system with limited actors only between investor and state is causing a, a, a huge, a, a large part of the problem in addition to the substance of the law that many have discussed just now. And I understand, although a um, uh, previous speaker mentioned that right now we see a more and more concentration of arbitrators that gets on the panel of um, investment arbitrations, but unfortunately the, the, the result of the cases are still very fragmented and the, the, the legal interpretation of the laws are still very fragmented. And most importantly, uh, the, 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 the traditional agreement, it's, it's primarily focused on a investment protection system rather than investment cooperation or facilitation system. Sorry. Um, so, so at ISC, we've been, um, for years, we've been um, realized that focusing on investment protection alone um, would not contributing to the promotion of sustainable, uh, sustainable development. And, and previous speakers have mentioned that there is no solid evidence linking the um, signing of those investment promotion uh, oriented uh, treaties with increase of FDI inflows, but also another fact is that um, investment protection oriented agreements, um, there, there are evidence showing uh, by, by surveying the companies, foreign companies um, investing in um, the countries that are receiving most of the FDIs, that these agreements rank the lowest on their list of things to consider when they're making investment. So, so the result is that it's not these, um, the traditional investment agreement, they're not um, necessarily benefiting to most of the investors, uh, but causing a huge uh, problems. Um, causing a huge uh, problems to governments when they're trying to regulate um, in the interest of the public. Um, <laughs> causing a huge uh, problem to communities, um, those who are not Consumers, not um, not uh, b b b contract parties, but just because they live in the place where the investment was made. They're also ca causing a lot of problems to domestic investors, which setting them on a um, very unbalanced um, uh, playing field. Um, and as we're witnessing an increasing overlap between global trade and investment, we can now identified or many gaps that need to be um, filled. For example, gaps, as um, James mentioned, that gaps between the resources available to um, private investors to make contributions to system development and the actual unfilled, inf unfulfilled um, public needs. Um, gaps between um, the amount of investment made and actually the amount of being transferred or translated into the development of um, environmental, um, economic, and social development. Um, and the gaps between um, different um, state and government agencies are incoher incoherent 
policy framework and legal obligations. So therefore, we think a flexible system is needed to fill those gaps. And these um, needs great, greater coordination and uh, coherence among all stakeholders, the states, the investors, um, private sectors, communities, um, think tanks. So here comes the second message that um, the focus on cooperation is really important. Um, we believe that this is not necessarily the time to establish new disciplines with binding adversarial dispute settlement, um, but actually a time to focus on developing practical tools and processes for um, integrating trade and investment. So especially in developing countries to advance um, sustainable um, development and reduce poverty. Um, and connecting to that, how can we make the um, how can we make um, cooperation happen? And the the third message is there are existing examples on how cooperation can be fostered. And uh, for example, mentioned earlier that Brazilians uh, model um, treaty that being signed. Um, so there have been six treaties, um, six parties already entered into um, the, 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 the investment treaties using a Brazilian's um, model, the focus on um, facilitation and promotion, um, putting a lot of emphasis on semantic agendas, on facilitating um, investments, um, and uh, relying somewhat borrowed from South Korean's 2010 investment act on the ombudsman system, the focus point, helping um, the private parties uh, communicating with the states to prevent um, investment um, um, disputes. Um, while, and there are actually ongoing efforts um, that actually fostering investment corporations. Uh, for example, at the um, global level, the efforts are being carried out in fostering um, um, investment corporations, the UNCTAD, as James mentioned, um, as offers a platform for, um, for dialogue. Um, and um, uh, also, um, UNCTAD is working at the country level um, on um, promoting, uh, with investment promotion agencies um, to do the underground work. Now, um, at regional level, ISD is working um, on investment cooperation and facilitation with um, regional organizations. And we also organize any forums for um, investment treaty negotiators um, and uh, for, for developing um, countries and uh, trying to foster um, the South-South cooperation in the field. Now, um, previous um, speakers mentioned a principles are being built at the T20 level. I, I'm sorry, G20 um, level. Um, and I'd like to share that uh, um, at uh, our last forum um, for developing country negotiators, um, um, the, the, the negotiators from developing country also um, seems to um, have a convergence of understanding that um, principles should be um, um, brought out um, from, uh, at the uh, uh, from South South perspective as well. So uh, it, it seems that right now we're we're having this moving forward momentum on um, principle building. So um, last message, um, we think the dialogue at uh, UNCTAD right now could be uh, strengthened at the uh, upcoming UNCTAD 14, and um, a focus um, should be given to UNCTAD to integrate trade and investment cooperation um, with the view to advancing the sustainable development goals. Now, um, and also IOC is also willing to work, work with governments and think tanks to facilitate this process. Thank you very much. And thanks for the insightful messages from Zhou Zhang. And if, it uh, if it time is very tight, we can welcome uh, very short comments or questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Han Bing. Um, 
Um, I'm Han Bing from CAS. Uh, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you uh, for all the uh, speakers uh, and for presentations. And uh, then I'd like to give some comments to uh, ASO's uh, presentation first. Um, I, I think you mentioned that uh, to, uh, to resolve the uh, uh, investment uh, 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 investment disputes settlement mechanisms. Uh, one of the idea is building a global uh, investment court. It might, I think it might be influenced by the political view of each country. So it is uh, may, maybe it, it is difficult to realize in a short term, but uh, uh, it could be a long-term goal. Uh, secondly, I'd, li I'd like to give, uh, uh, ask, I'd like to ask a question with uh, James Zhang. Uh, in, in your presentation, you have mentioned that uh, uh, the, uh, in this year, the tw uh, 2016 G20 uh, summit, summit, one of the investment agenda is to explore the development of non-bending uh, guiding principles uh, for global investment. Uh, uh, so my question is that uh, do you think uh, from the, uh, uh, in order to help the uh, inform of uh, RRA's regime, uh, do you think what uh, specific specific principles should be included uh, in uh, this uh, non-bending uh, 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 framework? Uh, thank you. Uh, will you answer these questions? No. Okay. Yes, it, it's better now since time is tight. Okay, thank you very much. This is a question I'm. I don't feel comfortable to answer, <laughs> yeah. because I'm part of the process. I think I think the, the G20 members are working on that. Um, I think it's better not to answer it, and you will see it perhaps at the end of the day, by the time of September. Thank you. Would you like to give some response? Well, um, the the um, the first uh, first intervention, I think it was a comment, and I would agree. I mean, of course, it takes quite some time to uh, build a multilateral investment court system on the basis of uh, of bilateral treaties. Yeah, of course, I would agree. Uh, thank you. So, uh, other comments or questions? Since uh, we still have some time well, when we're waiting for the DG's presentation. Uh, okay, Professor. Well, thank you. If nobody has a question, I have a question for Mr. Pauline. You know, you spoke about the big coherence between the different uh, investment treaties, which is certainly true. But then you explained that as being the organic evolution of the treaties. It seems to me, if you look at what has happened, it's rather different. It's basically some big investor states who have pushed those treaties on the countries who needed investments, and basically afterwards everybody had to accept accept the same thing. So I think it's more of a, of a process where actually the OECD countries, on the basis of the MEA, uh, promoted an investment treaty which, there, which then was imposed on the other countries. Yeah, I think that, that is probably a, a correct vision in the mid-1990s. The convergence I'm referring to is what is happening right now. And it's not convergence around the traditional EU model BIT with very strong protection of investors. The convergence we see um, is around a very explicit return of the state, where they preserve the right to regulate, where they very carefully de de define what indirect expropriation is. That's the kind of convergence I'm talking about. And it's probably a better one than the one you were talking about. Okay. Actually, my question is a little bit different, and see, the G20 is, is formed as a response to the global financial crisis, mm -hmm. and still their mainstreaming thinking is dominated by the financial ministries. 
and uh, when we are making the recommendations for the trade and economic ministers and what could be the take for them uh, from the fiscal policy or the monetary policy do you have any recommendations to make and uh, from that aspect <clears throat> Sorry, I just tried to understand your question that you mentioned that what G20 can do with regard to the fiscal policies. Yes, and how they can reorient their fiscal and monetary policies towards the recommendations that you are making. Is, for example, the uh, minister's meeting. Yeah. I think, um, if I understand correctly, G20 have different work streams, um, or they call the tracks. Um, the issues related to finance, including fiscal policies and macroeconomic issues, is dealt with a track called the finance minister's track, while this trade investment belongs to the track which is called the Sherpa's track, and it's trade investment minister's work. So they work in parallel, um, and for that track, they are dealing with the issues for quite some time. And um, in terms of the interrelationship between the two tracks, um, there has been emphasize, uh, emphasis on this um, at the Sherpa's level to see how they can coordinate. But in terms of substance, it seems that the trade investment work stream focus on, 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 on the more on the systemic issues and issues related to trade growth. Um, I don't think it, it involves much of the fiscal policies except for trade financing and related issues. But I think that's only a fraction of the trade and investment work stream. Um, for the time being, the dialogue is only at the level of the Sherpa when the two work streams meet. Um, but I don't see much so far is happening at that level, particularly, I think, in the, in the work stream on trade investment. It's a new work stream, so it hasn't really dealt with um, uh, the, f the fiscal issues. While before the trade investment working uh, stream started and um, the investment and issues was dealt with the finance stream and the development work stream. And at that time, there was some collaboration. At this stage, even the long-term investment, financing for long-term investment is dealt with the finance stream. I think they work in parallel. Professor Su. Yes, uh, I have questions uh, to Professor uh, Jost. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, for the assessment, for the convergence of different uh, treaties, uh, investment treaties, a lot of that. And also you have numbers for, uh, for example, for 82% of uh, seamless or, or uh, seam uh, for TPPs or others. So my question is a technic, uh, technical question about how to uh, assess uh, such as uh, uh, similarity of different type of uh, treaties. Yeah, for example, maybe uh, TPPs and uh, uh, USA and the uh, Colombia uh, treaties for, for that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it really is a, a, a computer software program where you compare text, but not words, but groups of words. It's, a, it's based on plagiarism software that I also use when my students submit exams to double check they are not copying each other. Of course, it doesn't give you the full picture, but it gives a, a good proxy. That's why we combine text analysis with coding, where you really look at uh, what provisions are in there, what provisions are not in there, and that gives you a better sense. But then you really have to go through a third level, and that is to sit down as a human being, as a lawyer, and look at um, how is an, a clause worded specifically as opposed to another treaty. So there's different levels at which you can compare treaties.
but it, and they're all proxies, obviously, but they give you some sense. Uh, thank you, Yang Dong, uh, and thank you for a great panel. Just uh, maybe to confirm with Jost um, as well, and you see how your presentation has provoked so much interest, uh, that um, the, the fact that there is um, uh, this emerging organic uh, convergence or uh, in, in treaty making on investment, which we agree, we have documented some of that in the Asia Pacific region particularly, but also from the perspective that you just mentioned. Um, so with respect to the right to regulate, uh, benefit sharing, responsibility of investors uh, and so on. So, so it seems to be uh, a complete different angle from what we had uh, 20 years ago, of course, and that's welcome. Um, it, it doesn't take, um, I think, um, away the urgency of uh, uh, enabling that that convergence happens uh, in a faster manner, such that uh, investment, particularly in productive assets, is accelerated. And I, I think, so, so my comment goes to what the G20 is trying to do. So the, the idea of the, of the guiding principles for global investment policy making, as well as the, the idea of, the, of coming up with a, a G20 investment uh, promotion and, and um, uh, facilitation package, are, are the, uh, really geared towards that, towards making sure that the, the immense gap that we have uh, today between uh, the aspirations and the needs, uh, for instance, uh, as, as they are outlined in SDGs and Agenda 2030 on foreign direct investment and uh, the actual investment that is going uh, to uh, the, uh, so the attainment of those goals or, or just uh, investment that is going to, to the development world. Uh, again, one, one uh, um, figure that I like to quote from, from James uh, Shan's studies is, is, uh, is uh, 2015, uh, so about $36 billion of FDI going to, to Africa, to Sub-Saharan Africa, out of $1.7 trillion of foreign direct investment at the global level. And so what we need really is something that accelerates uh, turning, again, the, the huge amount of, of capital stocks that we have in the world available into productive investment in w where it's needed. And so the guidelines seem to me that are in that direction. Well, so would you agree to that? We're not talking about multilateralization, but rather anything that works to accelerate uh, that uh, convergence and, and therefore facilitate investment. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm just not sure that the current template of, for example, the TPP investment chapter does that. I mean, treaty negotiators are not rational actors. They take the template of what they've done the year before and they just continue to provide for the same thing. I'm completely with you that this is the goal, but I'm not sure that the current template we have is ready to achieve that goal. It's a repetition of investment protection provisions, um, there's not much on, for example, the gentleman earlier mentioned uh, tax policy. For me, a big question is you have um, host countries who are competing for investment and to do so, they, they lower their tax rates and they, they engage in a competitive race to the bottom, lowering taxes through, ta through investment incentives. Investment treaties don't deal with this. They don't deal with sector specific issues. They don't change depending on the country, which I think is strange. So what I'm saying is it's too early to multilateralize. Let's think about guidelines. Let's think about uh, trade um, investment facilitation um, and then um, multilateralize. I should speak in favor of multilateralization when the DG comes in. <laughs> Welcome, DG. Uh, and thanks for the valuable presentations of these panelists. And I will close the session and welcome Director Yuan Zhang to host the next session of keynote speech of DG. Welcome.